Morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Good. But uh, let me say, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to uh, come up and talk to you today. What I'd like to do is to go through a little uh, discussion about our organization and about some of the challenges that we face, and then talk to you about uh, a business plan that we we put together uh, to address those challenges. And But what I'm really most interested in from, from you is hearing what's on your mind. And it, it, it helps me from a standpoint of understanding you know, what our customers are thinking, but it also gives me an understanding too of, of from a business perspective, how you see some of the issues that we face uh, and, and uh, potentially make some good suggestions to us on how we can improve uh, what we're doing. From an organizational standpoint, the Postal Service is, is still a very important part of the American economy. A lot of people say, geez, you know, with email and, and um, text messaging and now, of course, the, smarts, uh, the cell phones and smartphones and bill payment online, the Postal Service certainly has, uh, has faded from some areas as part of a person's daily life. But the Postal Service is still the anchor of a very, very large industry. The mailing industry itself is, is an industry that employs almost 800,000 people. And in that 800,000 people, it, it's, there's a substantial uh, portion of, uh, there's a substantial portion of the GDP that's spent on a daily basis. When you look at, a, at the supply chain uh, that we're a part of, you know, we go all the way back up to the forestry and timber industry in this United States. 40% of all paper ends up in the mail. And so when you think about that supply chain from forestry and timber, all the way through paper processing, through the print logistics organizations in this country, and then what happens, what, what shows up in your mailbox, along with packages that come through, you can see the size and scope of this organization. Um, we also play a very, very important role in the American economy, even in a digital age. Uh, 40% of Americans still do pay their bills through the mail, which I'm very happy for because it's about 45 cents a piece for each one of those. But, um, and, and we still uh, are a very important player with bill presentment, statement presentment, advertising, the periodical industry, newspaper, magazines, and of course, uh, the package business. And what we've seen over the course of the last few years is, is as we've seen a decrease in some areas, we've seen a, a nice growth in others. And, and one of the things that we're proud of in this organization is the fact that as technology has changed, so has the Postal Service. If you take a look over the course of our history, um, we, we have been at the forefront of a lot of changes. And our history is long. I mean, we're, we've been in existence for almost 240 years, so we've seen a lot of change in that time frame. But, we were talking at the table this morning, and uh, I was I was telling I was telling Phil that back in 1910, the Postal Service had the largest set of stables and horses in America. By 1920, we had the largest fleet. And as you look at what's happened from a technology standpoint, all these years, whether it's telegraph, telephone, television, fax machines, email, and now smart telephones, there's always been major changes in technology. And the Postal Service has had to make major changes in order to keep up with the times and or fit in the right role that we need to continue to be the important player that we are in the American economy. So today, what you see is, is, is a big change in the business model. What's happened to us in the course of, of, of the last 10 years is what's happened to a lot of American industry. If you look around and see what's happened from, it, from it, uh, the perspective of the internet, it has been a very, very disruptive technology. Look at companies like, like um, Kodak. I mean, if you think about it, how many people in this room, let me see, I'm not going to ask you how many pay bills online, because I'll, I'll probably be depressed. But no, I want to I ask you, how many people in this room have taken a picture in the last month with a film camera? Okay, think about that. And think about digital cameras themselves and the threat that they're under now with smartphones. You know, iPhones will now be replacing digital cameras, which even a few years back seemed like the latest and greatest technology. So that's the pace of change that continues to happen. And from our perspective, you know, we've got to change with, the, with, with what's going on in the country. So what's happened over the course of time, if you, if you, if you take a look at, 
at, at our business model from a uh, from a from a long term perspective. The Postal Service grew with the population of this United States as we moved west. We moved west, and as the population increased, for every new house, there would be new mail that would come through with bills to be presented and bills to be paid and advertisements, and that worked great until about the year 2000. In 2000. The population continued to grow up, go up. We had a continuation of housing developments go up, and mail started to flatten off. The second issue that we started to see within that within our business model was what we call the mail mix change, and that is more less first class mail, more standard mail, more advertising, more packages. And and when you get advertising and packages, it's good revenue for us, but advertising brings in less margin, less profit. Packages are more work. And first class mail, that 45 cent stamp that you put on a bill payment, it probably costs us about two cents to process that. It's, we're very, very efficient. And that has, been the under, that has been the underpinning of the finances of this organization for many, many years. So as that started to drop off, now we have to make some changes. So for the better part of, this, of, of the first decade of, the two, of the, uh, this new century, we worked very hard to take internal cost out. We have re reduced the cost in this organization, bent the cost line in the course of the last uh, 11 years by about $20 billion. That's not $20 billion in, in just added up totally. That's bending the cost line. And we've done that by reducing headcount. We, we reduced the headcount in the organization as of right now from the year 2000 now by about 265,000 people career, people, paychecks. And we've done that without layoffs. We're very proud of that. We were very proud of the fact that we've been able to manage attrition and we've been able to make changes, move people around. And we also have not had any major impact on the infrastructure of our organization. That means service standards, you put your mail in a mailbox, it gets to the destination between one, two, or three days somewhere across the country, even, even three days to Hawaii from here in Baltimore. And we've also managed to, to keep open and operate about 32,000 post offices and uh, deliver mail six days a week. The problem that we've got now is this. We have taken out a substantial amount of, that, of, of, the, of the cost within the organization, but infrastructure now has to be addressed as we've, as we've lost this volume and as it continues to go down. So that's the situation that we find ourselves in right now. So in, over the course of, of the last year or so, we've, we've put together a strategic plan, and what we've done is taken a forward look. What will our business look like five years from now, 10 years from now? And we've hired some consultants, some of the best in the industry, Boston Consulting and McKinsey, and uh, we've had them come in, and they've spent time with us, with customers, to understand what is going to happen from a postal service perspective over this, over this time period. And a couple things. Number one, we see that we will continue to lose first class mail. People will pay bills online. It's free and it is convenient and it is awfully hard to compete against. Free is awful hard to get under, get, you can't price below that. Although we do have some customers that would like us to pay them to deliver their product, but you know, can't do that. But um, you know, so, 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 so that's an issue. And, but on, on the brighter side, uh, we know that there are some, some, even though the first class mail loss will occur, we do know that package mail, especially with the uh, e-commerce growth that we see today, and it is growing leaps and bounds, uh, will have a, a good share of that. And the other thing that we, we, we know is, is that advertising is still a very uh, important part of, of what we do. And advertising from a, from a mail perspective, uh, you might find interesting is probably the best way to advertise from a return on investment. And if you think about that, next time you're watching TV, if you can't sleep at three o'clock in the morning, turn on some obscure channel and watch what's being advertised. And then ask yourself, who made the decision to spend this money? And it could have been spent a lot better in the mail. At any rate, <laughs> but, but, but so we know where our strengths are going forward. So we, we've put a plan together and I'd like to talk to you about it a little bit because I think it's, it's important for, for you to understand the direction that we think that we need to go in and, 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 and understand how we have to uh, accomplish that. 
Um, one of the things that um, I, I enjoy talking to people about is, is, is my job. I probably want one of the more interesting jobs in the United States. We have a board of governors, we have a regulatory commission, we've got Congress with 535 members, and we have 305 million customers. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting, everybody has an opinion. And trying to get through those opinions and figure out what's the best thing to do for the organization and what's the best thing to do for our customers is always something that, that, that you know, proves a little daunting. So when you, when you put out major change, you get some pretty interesting reactions from people. So here's what we're doing. We have to reduce the costs of our organization by about $20 billion over the next four to five years in order to A, get profitable, B, get out of debt. Right now, as I speak, we lose $25 million a day and we are $13 billion in debt. And you're probably sitting there thinking, holy Hannah, how did that happen? Um, couple things. Number one, um, bill payment online has been devastating from a standpoint of, of cost and, and revenue. I mean, the, the revenue loss has been, has been substantial and again, from a cost perspective, as I told you, it's very easy for us to process that mail going through. You know, so, so that's where we, we've, we've not been able to take the cost out as you lose that specific volume because that's all automated through our system. Um, the, the other thing that has happened has been the recession, and it's affected everybody in this room. And as the recession has, has you know, knocked off about 25% of our total volume between recession and the electronic diversion, you know, we've been able to take costs out to get to the point where we're keeping our head above water. The problem that we're faced with right now is the fact that besides these two issues, we are required by law to pre-fund retiree health benefits to the tune of five and a half billion dollars a year. So over the last five years, we've had to write a check out, and it's hard to write a check out for five and a half billion, believe me, whenever you don't have the money to cover it. And we've had to borrow to make that, to make that payment. So volumes dropped. We've got this payment, and we've got um, the, the, the effects of the recession. So looking ahead, we know volume will continue to go down. The other things like the ad mail will slowly creep back up, and packages will take off. We put together this plan to address all these issues. First of all, the infra infrastructure. Um, we are proposing right now, and I have to do this through legislation, to move from six-day to five-day delivery. That's a big change. You know, people are, oh, my goodness, you know. Um, but when you ask the American public, 80% of the American public say, you should do that. If you're going to make changes, you should, you should do that. Because as Phil said, we take no tax money. We do not want to be a burden on the American public. We do not want to go in there with our hand out and ask for taxes. So you have to start making infrastructure change. So you change six to five day. Now, in that proposal, we would still keep post offices open. We would still deliver packages. We'd still run our network. So things that you throw in the mail Friday, you'd get on Mondays across the country or maybe Tuesday if it's coast to coast. But that's worth almost $3 billion in cost on a, on a yearly basis. So you bend that cost line by $3 billion. Addressing the retiree health issue. I've probably learned more about health care in the last nine months than I ever could have imagined. And I'll tell you what's amazing about health care for us is is, is part of the federal government. We are part of uh, uh, FEHB, Federal Employee Health Benefits System. And, and for years, people said, oh, it's the greatest system going. But when you start to dig in, you find out it isn't the greatest system going. What you end up with is a group of federal plans, 205, managed by Office of Personnel Management, and it's pretty much just the management is printing the brochures and sending them out. So what we found as we've dug into this, and we've looked at benefits and, and cost levels uh, from many private firms, um, owning our own health care and competing a one million person health care would save us somewhere in the tune of about 1.5 billion a year, and, and we'd probably have better benefits than we have now. In fact, I know we would. And you know, we, we have a, what, what's called the uh, uh, mailing, mailers, advise, uh, mailers Technical Advisory Committee, MTAC. And I was there a couple of months ago, and this guy comes up to me, and he's telling me, oh, hey, you know, I got a refund for my triglycerides and blood pressure on health benefits. And I'm like, 
So he's going through this whole description, and I'm thinking, man, this is great. And he's telling me, oh, yeah, we just recompeted the thing, and, and I'm thinking, we're paying for it. <laughs> the Postal Service hasn't competed anything. And when you look around at the benefit levels that people have been able to achieve at a much better cost, you know, that's something we need to look at. So between, between competing health care and resolving some other issues around the retiree health benefits, mainly changing some of the amortization schedules and requiring our employees to use Medicare and looking at some of the accounting methods, we think that there's a P&L change uh, there on the health care loan of $7 billion a year. So resolving that gets us from an annual loss of about 5 or $6 billion to a break-even right there. You add on the 6 to 5 day, and then some of the other network changes that we're making right now is we're consolidating facilities down and consolidating some of the small post offices uh, that's worth that's worth over the same period about another five to six billion dollars. So so the plan as we've laid it out from an infrastructure perspective gets us a long way of the way to do a couple things. Number one, it gets us profitable. It'll put us on firm footing that we make six million dollars a day, and it also allows us to eliminate the debt as we know it. Now. The other thing that goes on with us is, you know, we the po people will talk about the post service from a standpoint of uh, of financial issues and financial burdens. Uh, we have the most fully funded retirement plans in the United States. Matter of fact, we're overfunded by one fund by eleven billion dollars. So part of the legislation also is to get that money and just write a check and pay the debt down, and that and we'll do that. And the other thing that we that we've got is uh, is is we have funded 43 billion dollars into pre-funding retiree health benefits. So so between two funds that cover retirement plus the employee retiree health benefits, we are sitting on about 325 billion dollars in assets to cover long-term costs for retirement and health care. So from that perspective, uh, we're in pretty good shape, and we will not be a burden for the taxpayers. Finally, the last issue that we're facing and that we've got to work through, of course, is our, our major cost uh, center, and that's the cost of labor. You deliver mail to you know, 165 million addresses on a daily basis, you are going to have a lot of people in this in the organization. And as I told you, we've reduced the headcount by about 260,000. We still have about 540,000 people on the rolls right now, and, and uh, they do a very good job. And, one of the things we're doing going forward is trying to resolve and get more flexible with the employee contracts going forward. We have four unions, three what we call management associations, and we're making a lot of changes that way. You know, more flexibility in the workplace, uh, more of a non-career flexible employment schedule so that, so that we can pull that cost of labor from 78%. I'd, I'm shooting to get it down into the mid-60s. But that also is worth about Four, three to four billion dollars in that same time period over the next few years. So our plan is make these changes. Some involve legislation, some involve some things that we can do ourselves. But the game plan is again to reduce the cost by about uh, 20 billion dollars between now and the end of uh, 2015. That's a 30 percent reduction in our total operating costs. But what that will do, that will get us on good firm footing going forward. From a from a revenue standpoint, people say, geez, you know, all you talk about is cost. The unfortunate thing is, is this. Within the revenue line, uh, we, we, our, our goal to a large extent is to, is to hold steady as we go forward. We know that there is plenty of growth in the package business, and we're taking advantage of that. We do a lot of last mile work for FedEx and UPS. FedEx right now is our fourth largest customer. UPS is now broken into the top 10. Our largest customer is eBay. By the end of this year, eBay will be our largest customer. The interesting thing about eBay is it is a collection of customers for, from the whole United States that go through the eBay payment and shipping engine. You know, so it's eBay as a customer, but it is made up of thousands and thousands of thousands of individual shippers. And when you see the growth that's occurred in that area over the course of time, it's been truly amazing. Amazon's a big customer. Uh, we're working very closely uh, going out into the future with a lot of the retailers because you know what? As the internet has affected us, as the internet has affected newspapers and filmmakers and everybody else like that, the internet is also affecting retail. 
And so we know there's a bright spot going forward that way. Another area that we know there's opportunities from a retail or from a revenue perspective is in ad mail. Um, the best way to get to the internet is through the mail, period. If you think about it, think about it right now. What do you look at on your smartphone or on your computer? Things that you are already looking at, things that you know about. But if, you're a, if you have a business out there and you want to get known and you want customers to come to your site, the best way to do it is to go through the mail because you look at your mail and you might see something of interest and that postcard or that message that comes through says, hey, I'm out there, visit my website, and all of a sudden that becomes a spot that you visit on a regular basis. And we know, and, and time and time again, we've heard customers have come in and said, I have found the most direct way to get people to my site is through the mail. And, and you get them to those sites, and with the, the supply chain process that we've got now, with shipments coming off of uh, uh, smart mail to some extent with smart tags, uh, we know there's plenty of growth in that going in, into the future. The final area, that we, that we are working on from a revenue standpoint is pretty much trying to hold the line on bills and statements. Bills and statements are an interesting thing. There's a, there, within many companies, and I'm sure there are people in here who have, who have been in this discussion, there's kind of a tug of war between the people saying, hey, let's go digital and save the money of mailing and printing. And on the other side, you've got people saying, if we go digital, we don't know if anybody will ever visit our website because of payment engines today. The bill comes in and it's paid on a credit card. You never, you, you, you lose touch with your customers. So one of the things that we've introduced this year is we call it two for the price of one. And that is for first class commercial mail, we, will not, we charge the same rate now for two ounces that we used to charge for one ounce. So if you want to put a message in there, a newsletter, something extra, a better quality of paper, something to make your mail piece stand out, you can do that too, and customers have, have picked up on that. And we have seen over the course of the last six months a, a per, pretty substantial slowdown in the diversion of first class statements and bills. Now, will that continue? Who knows? It probably will continue to move down over time because, hey, it's awfully hard to compete against the technologies that you have out there today. And as technology gets better and you get better use of smartphones and other types of smart devices, and, and as the age groups change, you're gonna have more people that will be more comfortable in that digital world. But it's our feeling if we can slow that down, because again, that's a very profitable portion of our business. That keeps us steady from a revenue standpoint. So bottom line is this, we think when our, with our business plan today and what, what's going on in the world out there between revenue, holding the line on revenue, the cost changes that we make, we can get the organization out of debt, debt free, matter of fact, cash on hand of about five or $6 billion by the end of 15 and making a small profit of maybe a, a billion a year. And people say, oh geez, you're a government agency, you shouldn't make a profit. We take no tax money and we're an ongoing business. You have to have a profit. You've got to have some income stream to be making some investments, vehicles. We, don't, we probably won't be building many facilities, many post offices, but you've got to make some ongoing investments, especially in the area of technology and outreach to customers, making it easy to use the mail, making it simple to do retail transactions with us. Those are all the things that you're gonna see coming up in the not so distant future. So from our perspective, you know, we've got a responsibility to keep this industry strong, to keep this postal service, which is at the hub of the industry strong, because there's a substantial portion of the American economy that depends on us. We think we have a good plan, working through some of these changes. Believe me, it's not easy. Like I told you, I have 535 very interested people who think, hey, I, I love what you're doing just about everything, but when you line up the just abouts, it ends up doing nothing. <laughs> so, so, so that's part of my job is to continually push in a very interesting environment to make these things happen because we're doing the right thing and we want to make sure we have a good strong postal service for this American economy and the American public uh, going on to the future. Again, thank you this morning for the opportunity. I would love to hear from you uh, what your thoughts are, some of your suggestions. If you think I'm all wet on something, tell me that too. Uh, but again, I appreciate the opportunity today, and I appreciate the business that you do with the Post Service. Thank you very much. Yep, you're on. Okay. Mr. Donahue, good morning. Welcome to Baltimore. That was fascinating. Just a couple. Uh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, introduce yourself. 
Good morning. I'm with a, a competing business school in town, but it's a pleasure to be here. I'm with the University of Baltimore. Uh, so welcome to Baltimore and uh, to the Hopkins campus here. A uh, couple of just quick questions and a comment. One is, tell me how many nines for your accuracy, 99.9. .9. You know, people, I think, give you a black eye when actually you're very good. Mm -hmm. uh, two is more on the innovation that you're talking about. I was intrigued by the two ounces for the price for one. I think more of that is what needs to get out into the public. Sure. And uh, I guess the third would be getting this legislation changed on the pre-funding. That seems to be foolish. I don't understand the accounting treatment for that, where it came from, what's the logic, and so forth. And my guess is you're frustrated sure. on, on that as well. And I'm part of that 20% that wants six days a week mail. But uh, Oh, man, okay. So, well, Thank you. We agree on about every, just about everything. <laughs> okay, let me let me let me address the pre-funding first because this is the craziest thing you'd ever hear. I mean, if you, the first couple times I ever got up to talk about this, people would look at you like, "Is this guy like making this story up?" Here's 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 what happened, and this is this is this is an only in the federal government kind of story, but it's true. Back in about 2002, we were we had experienced a um, a loss in in uh, uh, net income, and it was almost a billion dollars. And there was some concern at the time because with the recession, if you guys remember 2001 recession, we had just experienced anthrax attacks in the mail. There was some concern. Geez, what's going to happen to the postal service? So. The GAO, General Accounting Office, and I would think it's the Government Accountability Office, got involved and did an audit on our long-term uh, debt and, and responsibility issues, namely the um, retirement funds. Everybody thought we were underfunded. What they found is we were overfunded in both of the funds to the, to the point where the largest fund required no additional money to be put into it. So we're sitting there with somewhere around two and a half billion dollars a year that you know you don't need to uh, you, you don't need to put into that fund anymore now if you were a business you'd probably either invest in it or pay a bigger dividend or do something maybe you know buy stock back something like that so somebody said hey you know what you should do you should fund retiree health benefits that's a noble idea and you know that old saying the road to hell is paved with good intentions well it was the suggestion came up, pay those employee health benefits, which is not a bad idea because, again, we have re responsibilities going on in the future. And that's it. And I will tell you this. That is a major issue for Americans going forward. And I told you we, I learned a lot about health care. I learned a lot about health care and, and retirement costs and stuff that probably is somewhat unsettling if you dig into that stuff. But what, what, what happened was a law was changed in 2006 to require us to take the money, that $2.3 billion a year that we were putting into the retirement fund, and start funding retiree health benefits over the course of 40 years. And everybody was like, we're in, we, we're okay with that. We, we can, you know, looking forward, nobody really foresaw the recession. And we knew, it, we knew we were losing volume with electronic diversion. So we said, okay, we're fine with that. The problem that occurred was this, it was, it was like, Signing up for a 10-year or for a for a 40-year mortgage and not being able to get out of the deal and getting something back that instead of a 40-year payment it came back with a 10-year payment. From a, for those of you who are know a little bit about the federal government, there's a, it's called scoring the way that bills score the incoming incoming and outgoing revenues through the the consolidated budget. Even though we're not on budget. Since the fact we were paying into this retiree health benefits, it was considered uh, incoming money. And they said, well, the rules are you have to pay it in 10 years instead of 40 years. So after we signed up, we got a bill back for five and a half billion a year instead of <laughs> two billion. The road to hell is paid with good intentions. So, so that was okay, and we still thought we'd be all right doing that. But when the recession hit, in a matter of two years, our volume dropped off by 21%, and then, and then subsequently another couple percent down to 25, and we haven't had the money to make that payment. 
trying to get that change, I, I will tell you, it's amazing, you know, because once the monies are going in, that's the hardest change, to say, hey, you can't have that money anymore. There's no reason we should pay it. I mean, theoretically, we've, we've actually put a plan in our business plan, we've proven that we don't need to fund one more dime between a combination of required Medicare, owning our own health benefits, and changing some of the accounting practices going forward. Um, I'm losing that battle at this point, but you know I think even the legislation that's going to be uh, passed, hopefully within the next couple months, uh, relieves us of the five-five and still gives us an opportunity to resolve that going forward. But uh, uh, that's something we that's an issue that we have to to work through. Nobody else has that requirement, and uh, it has been a major it has been a major source of economic problem for us. On the innovation. Um, there's a lot going on from an innovation standpoint. Um, uh, we, we, we purposefully don't get up and talk about a lot of things, only because there are many people that if you start talking, well, you know, we can grow this or that, okay, fine, then don't come up and ask for any changes, uh, namely making the six to five day and some of the other, uh, other changes that we're making. Um, We've introduced a, a couple of products this year. One is called Every Door Direct, and it's a very simple. You might have seen our ads on TV, the guy with the car wash or somebody with the dressed up like a chicken. They're pretty pretty good ads. But the whole idea is, is that you can go online very simply and draw it for your business and use very simple software to kind of design a very simple mail product for you to put together and drop off with us for 14 and a half cents a piece. It is the most direct way to get in front of your customer's eyes. Very, very, very efficient, very effective. It's been growing. It'll probably turn into, within three years, a billion dollar business from, from zero a couple uh, a year ago. Uh, in the digital space, we think that there are some very interesting opportunities for us there. Uh, we fulfill a role today sealed against protection, first class mail, hard copy. Um, we think between some of the offerings that we can make there and, and along with the, we have what's called the Postal Inspection Service uh, uh, and a, a group uh, within our organization, law enforcement, uh, we, we can uh, help to improve some of the security through some digital messaging. We also think that there are big, big opportunities in terms of digital going out into the future where you combine hard copy and digital at the same time, just to give you an, an idea of some of the thoughts. Um, what if you got a catalog in the mail? We know when you're getting the catalog. In fact, we know within about five to 10 minutes of delivery what's gonna show up in your mailbox, that you would be able to get a message that gave you on page 10 of that catalog a special deal if you take advantage today. I mean, there's the, when you look at the opportunity to work off of that hard copy delivery to a house with the technology that's out there today in terms of GPS and what we know as far as mail pieces that come through with intelligent mail barcodes, there's all kind of very interesting opportunities for people to use us to continue to uh, market uh, products going through, and we think that there's uh, uh, we think there's big opportunities in that way. From a, uh, and, and, and the same thing goes from you know, package business, the same thing goes in, in, in other forms of ad mail. So there's plenty of, of, of uh, interesting opportunities. The other thing that we view, we view ourselves to a large extent as a platform, and then you have other people that can innovate off of that. So whether it's in the digital space or in the hard copy space, take any platform that we own, zip codes. That's an interesting platform. Think about what's happened in the world of zip codes, in the world of commerce in this United States that's based on zip codes. It's an astounding number of things off of a simple platform. And we provide those same platforms for hard copy letter delivery, package delivery, and again, we'll work, we're working with customers for interesting ideas to expand and change that platform. From a legislative perspective, um, it's a dogfight. It is, it is a dogfight. I mean, you've got, uh, right now, right now, it's, it's very hard to get anybody to agree on anything. Um, it, it is, I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're, we, there's a piece of legislation that was introduced yesterday in the Senate. And the funny thing and frustrating thing for me is, is we've laid this plan out and we've worked cl closely with Evercore partners and a restructuring firm and they've helped us to put it together, but also validated. I mean, they said, hey, we'll go up and testify. And uh, 
trying to get some of those things through and sit down with people to understand, hey, volume is going away. We've already taken substantial cost out. You know, there's only a couple decision points you can make. You can eliminate a six day of delivery or employees have to take a 9% pay cut. And, you know, people aren't clamoring, oh, give me a 9% pay cut, you know. So, uh, no, it's true. I mean, and that's the kind of stuff that you look at. When you're looking to, to fill that gap, there are certain, there are only certain levers that you can, that you can turn. People say, well, just raise the price of stamps. You raise the price of stamps, there's a substantial, substantial industry lobby that doesn't want anything changed that way. We are under a price cap now, CPI price cap. Um, even we've even made a proposal. Hey, let us throw an extra penny on the stamp going forward. I mean, you go to some countries. Phil mentioned it. Norway charges a dollar twenty-five for a stamp. Germany seventy-five cents. And it's Germany. Geez, they're like delivering Pennsylvania and Ohio. That'd be great. We wouldn't have any trouble. But but that's the kind of fighting that goes on. And within this industry, there are very entrenched stakeholders who don't want to give. And you have the same issues with the unions. Hey, no good back there. But, you know, my, my pitch, coming from, I'm from Pittsburgh, and I'm glad I didn't hear any Baltimore jokes, but I see some of you guys dressed in purple. Um, I was going to bring my Super Bowl towel. <laughs> um, uh, but at any rate, um, at any rate, though, we saw what happens when you keep your head in the sand and don't do anything. In our city, we lost 100,000 jobs between 60,000 in the steel mill and 40,000 support jobs for people not doing what they needed to do to make change. And so that's why we're trying to push these things. But it's not been easy. Thank you. Yes. Good morning. My name is Sean Barron. I'm from the Global MBA program. I was just wondering, uh, what's the largest change that your organization has had to make as a result of declining volume? The biggest, um, we've been making many changes already that are pretty much um, invisible from, from the American public. Uh, probably the biggest change to date has been transitioning from a world of, of letter and flat mail, flat being like magazines, handled manually to an automated environment. That's why we've been able to reduce the headcount substantially. Every day, the letter carrier that comes to your house, he or she gets 95% of their mail in order from a machine in the Baltimore Post Office. They don't, nobody touches that. Mail that you throw in the mailbox, a little envelope to pay an electric bill, if you do that, nobody touches that. So we've been able to automate using the, the world's best optical character technology. I was, I'll tell you, the other day I was, uh, we have a yearly function with customers called the Postal Forum in Orlando, Florida. And they were saying to me, hey, you know, write your name down here and we'll show you how, how quickly we can resolve it. And they, I mean, these machines can resolve this stuff, handwriting, at a, at a rate of about 10 letters a second. I mean, that's, it's extremely good technology. And I was thinking back in 1990, I was in the same place, Orlando, Florida, and I remember we were first starting to talk about it, and they said, write a letter, Don, and we'll show you how fast we can do it. And I wrote an A, and it took 30 seconds. I thought, man, this is going nowhere. And, uh, <laughs> but but it, it's amazing, that technology. And then again, like I said to you guys before, we, we are people in this organization. We embrace technology. We run with it. We are on the cutting edge of many things that because we've had to from a survival standpoint. So making that transition from the people doing what they did to what they do now has been the biggest change. It's taken us 10 years to make these changes to, to really get the efficiency out of it. Some, you'll see big changes coming up. You know, the retail environment, moving away from the post office as you know it into supermarkets and drugstores and, and by being able to buy stamps at, in, in, at the counter of a giant supermarket instead of what you do. You'll see those changes. Um, so there's plenty more to come ahead. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for coming. My name is Lindsay Thompson. I'm Hi. one of the professors here. I have a question about your retail product inventory control system. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that in the many post offices that I've gone to over the course of my lifetime, there are these product displays 
And I, are they loss leaders? Because people just walk away with them and don't pay. <laughs> That's not watching? good. Where are you visiting? <laughs> um, um, you know, it's, that's an interesting thing. Um, we do have shrinkage in, in <laughs> you try to make things convenient. Um, it, it, it's an issue. The, 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 you you want to make it simple for customers. And this is something that, you know, we're, as, we, as we change what we do from a retail perspective, um, what, what we need to do is to, be, is to be where people are from a shopping perspective and not be another stop. And you know, uh, the this, the world of merchandising and setting up uh, whether it's a self-service kiosk or having stamps and prepaid flat-rate boxes available that you can just buy at the Walmart or or Target or CVS drugstore is where we need to go uh, in the future. The the um, if we do have people unfortunately taking things from us, that's something that, that isn't good. And we and and you know we've been we we have had to actually pull back in some of those places because people will walk out the door. But I think any any organization faces that. But we've got to make it convenient. I mean, if you think I don't know if you guys if any of you I'm sure you have have used our flat rate boxes. We think that is extremely convenient. If it fits, it ships. And forever stamps. That's a big change. You buy them now. You keep them forever. Uh, one of our biggest sellers of stamps now is Costco. Costco is probably the number one seller of what we call consignment stamps. And what they do is they sell them on a discount. We sell them to them for 3% off. They keep 1% and give you 2%. So you're going to see a lot more of that going out in the future. Um, you know, our, it's our feeling that you, you, you can make it as convenient as possible. There will be a day when you write something on a piece of mail and that would and as long as we know what you wrote and who you are that that will be your postage i mean it, it's that simple because we can read the face of every piece of mail that comes through the system now and there will be a day when you can write your email address down and we can deliver it to your house because we'll know your email address and your house address if you choose to give us that you know so there's a lot of changes coming up that way but um, um Retail, we have to change, even though people take advantage of us to some extent. Thank you. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry, over here. I'm... Oh, um, yeah, hello, my name's Samuel. I'm just a Baltimore resident. Hi. Um, I was going to ask you about your advertisements. Specifically, you were saying that the, they're one of your worst, uh, your worst profit margins. And you're talking about the, uh, the increase in advertisements going up over the next couple of years as the recession ends. And I was wondering if the signal to noise ratio that we see with real mail pieces versus spam, unsolicited kind of bulk mail, mm -hmm. um, if that's becoming a problem for, for you and your team. Um, it's, it, it's been very interesting, uh, the whole idea of, of unwanted mail. Um, we've had some people, well, you know, maybe, maybe we should have a do not mail campaign like do not phone. But when you ask customers, what don't you want? You know, somebody will come in and say, oh, I, I don't want, I, I'd, I'd like to get rid of junk mail. Okay, well, if you sign up for this, you won't get anymore. Well, wait a minute, I want to keep getting my Safeway coupons, or I want to get this and that. So what you end up with is, in your mailbox to some extent, are some things that you don't want. And there are some people that, 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 that want to try to see if you want it anyway, and that's part of the whole advertising outreach. Um, one of the things that I think that you'll see over the course of time, and you're probably seeing it now to some extent, is the, is the linkage between things that you buy and what you get in the mail. And there's a lot of smart people out there working off of that. Now a lot of them in the digital space, knowing that if you buy something online, if you're given an offer through the mail, you might jump on that too. So I think what I think over the course of time, some things like uh, like broadcast uh, advertising mail will continue to decline. Um, I think that you'll see an increase in some things like the every door direct where it's much more of a geographic aim. And I think you're going to see much more of the targeted mail because um, people in it's an interesting thing. People in the in the digital space um, have said time and time again, gosh, you know, it, it's so convenient, but we can't make any money on it. And the woman that was that left Yahoo a couple months ago, she had made the statement, people think it's easy to make money in digital. It isn't. In that fact, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday talking about that, 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 you know, a lot of these companies, including Facebook, 
they don't make a whole, they make money, but nowhere near what people had expected them to be making from an advertising standpoint. So I think that you'll see more and more um, directed advertising because even though it may seem kind of antiquated at times, people, people do look at their mail and they might not look at anything else, but everybody knows they'll look at that and, and you only have so much time to consume TV and stuff like that. So I think it'll get smarter. And I, the problem for us is, is, is extracting enough revenue and profit out of it. We have a cap on that from a CPI standpoint. And, we'll, and part of the profit opportunities are to figure out what other, what other money that you can make off of that in terms of some additional offerings, some follow-up digitally with the customer sending it that you can make a little bit of money. Thank you. Hi. Good morning, Mr. Donahue. Welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Joe Newbert. I'm a student with the uh, MSIS program here. And I have a, it's coming through clear, I have a question about your business model. Sure. Understanding the constraints that you're under from a, um, from a business model perspective, where would you like to go on the offensive the most from a change perspective? And what is the biggest public policy constraint to making that happen? Um, from a change perspective, um, there's, there are a number of things, there are a number of things that we have to do uh, across the board um, in terms of, 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 of major change. Um, we, think that, we think that the retail space uh, is, is an important one. Um, I think that the biggest concern that we've got in the retail space and the changes there is not even so much a legislative issue as it's, it's, it's an issue of working with the American public to make some of those changes because people are used to going to the post office to do things. Uh, an interesting statistic, I think it's right now 38% of all of our retail sales happen outside the postal service itself. Stamps, uh, mailings, um, package mailing. You know, so, so that's going to be, that's, that, is, that is a critical thing. The other thing is, is the whole ease of use issue. If you're a if you if you mail with us now with with a bulk mail permit, it's a pain in the rear end. It really is. We've not made that easy, and changing it to changing these things to make them easy is critical. This every door direct product I mentioned, there's no fees attached to that. You just bring it in here. Here's the write the check or give us a cash or take the debit or credit card, and it's that simple. And those are some of the things that, that we you know that we've got to change uh, in 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 the organization that are most important because infrastructure issues uh, the six to five day delivery changing how we have our facilities set up those are completely with the six to five isn't but the, the a lot of the other facility issues the network issues. Um, that's, trans that's, that's, that's not an issue for the public, because we've done a lot of survey work. People are like, oh, do you deliver mail overnight? Yes, at about 97% rate. You know, but people are like, oh, I thought it was mostly two to three day within a city area. So, so trying to change the things that are most important to our customers is what's critical, ease of use ease of use from a retail standpoint so that it's easy to continue to do business with us because it will continue to be as competitive as you know what out there in the package business and in the correspondence business. If, it, if you can go online and send a bunch of emails out or do some banner advertising uh, versus putting together a mailing, uh, we want the putting together a mailing to be easier and with a better ROI than, than what you'd see anywhere else. Those are the things we have to do first. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is Shareen, and I'm a global MBA student. And uh, you mentioned that FedEx and U UPS are customers yes. for, of USPS, but they're also partners and competitors as mm -hmm. well. Yep. So, and both of these companies are quite successful. And so even with Postal being a government organization, how does USPS plan to change aspects of its human capital structure to mirror private organizations? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, Fed, just uh, FedEx and UPS are big customers. We are FedEx's largest customer. We write FedEx a check for about one and a half billion a year to use their planes in the daytime, the ones they use at night, and we use them in the day. That way that saves us from having to have our own airline. So uh, that works out pretty good. 
from a from a people perspective, um, you know that there's there are people issues are probably next to growth issues the major issues that we face. Um, our average age in our organization is 53 years old. That's a, that's that's a, that's one of the only things I'm above average on, but. Um, uh, <laughs> But at any rate, though, it's a, that's an issue because by not hiring all these years and by reducing in, a, in, in what we think is a very humane way of doing things. You know, I told you I came up in Pittsburgh and I saw what happened when people just were laid off and shipped out. It was very devastating. Um, that has caused an issue for us from a, from a human capital perspective. Uh, one of the critical things that we've got to do and, and um, is, is, the, is the whole area of leadership development. Um, we're not seen as, a, a, you know, a, an up and coming sexy organization. You know, graduates from the John Hopkins Business School are not saying, geez, I'm gonna go work for the Postal Service. We have to try to talk them into that because we think that there is a very, very bright future in this organization. And getting people in at the, at the ground level with the opportunity to think about how do I, how can I make a difference in this organization is something we have to do. Um, it, you know, we, we were talking about that on the way up to Susan McKenna and Susan's responsible for that in, in her job. Um, the, the, you know, talent recruiting, talent development is, is critical going forward because you have to have people with a long runway in an organization to make a big difference. And, and we, you know, I, I, I think besides the whole issue around revenue, the next riskiest thing that we face, in fact, is the human capital and development of people coming up through the organization. So we have intern programs. We have to, we have to move faster on intern programs. If there are people in here that want to try an opportunity in an organization that you really will get an interesting opportunity like I had starting as a, I was a school, I was in University of Pittsburgh as a junior in college when I started here. In this postal service, you can pretty much do anything that you want, any field that you want to be in, you can be in. We do everything. And um, it's, an, it's an interesting place. Uh, you probably will not become a millionaire or a multimillionaire. You probably won't get in the one percent, but that's still pretty interesting. Um, but but um, if you if you want an opportunity uh, to try to to see end to end what a what happens in a big business, that's a great opportunity to work in the post service, and that's something we have to do to recruit people in for those. Thank you. Thank you. Oops, one, what one more? Okay. I'm getting the hook. My name's Angela Gazetta. I'm a researcher at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, of course, most Americans love the USPS. You know, it's, it's part of our soul. And you had talked about competing with email. Um, recently, I had to get some transcripts, and they had to come through the mail, and I needed them right away. Um, and I really wish they could be emailed to me. And I was wondering, had you guys talked about a federally protected USPS email where people can sign up and then you pay per as you send it, but it's official, it's protected, um, and anybody can have one? Yes. Uh, let me, on what we, what we've been looking at from a digital standpoint are, are a suite of products. We think that they're, we think that there are a couple of areas. Uh, one is, is sealed against inspection type of documents. Um, if you look at, there are people who send a lot of overnight documents still, and, and the reason they do that is because of some privacy issues or other concerns that somebody is looking at their email. And uh, we think there's definitely a spot for us in there. It's, it's an interesting thing that we've got to work through uh, from a number of privacy laws in the federal government, and we're working through some of those things right now. But we think we're in an excellent position because, number one, we have the brand, we have the trust, and we also have the law enforcement ability to do something about it. The biggest problem people face today, when you get into something where, you, where your systems are hacked or something's happened with your finances, there's nowhere to turn. I mean, you, you know, if you look around in this country, whether it's local law enforcement, state law enforcement, or federal law enforcement, they're tied up with many other things, and, and cybercrime, unfortunately, is well down the list. That said, cybercrime is a major issue. Having had the opportunity to see 
uh, some work that's been done by Carnegie Mellon University with the FBI and with our Postal Inspection Service. There's a lot of bad people on the other side of the computer screen, so that's an issue. We also think from a digital standpoint, there's we play a very interesting role within the package business from an information and a redirection standpoint. There's you know a one-stop shop with a postal site is something we think there's a lot of value in. We've just recently inter introduced something in the Washington area called GoPost. And what GoPost is, it, it's, let's say you live at 123 Main Street, but you work in Baltimore and, or you go to school here and you say, I'd like to order something from Amazon, but if I have it sent to my house, it has to be picked up at the local post office because I don't have a, my mail slot's not big enough you can redirect to what's called the GoPost and you get an email message with a code and where the GoPost location is, you can get on and pick it up. It's like a secure parcel locker. And we think there's big opportunity here from a convenience standpoint, especially in this world of growing e-commerce. So uh, those are some of the areas that we think that we can play a very important role from a digital standpoint in. Thank you.